I'm holding back nothing, nothing from you. This is the start of resurrection. When you begin to come from death, I'm gonna trust you. I'm holding back nothing, nothing from you.
Welcome back. I'm back. Although I did take a nap. Did you? Well, good morning. We are so glad that you're here today. Hopefully, as you came in, uh, you grabbed one of the bulletins. If you did not, make sure you grab one on your way out. I, I want to highlight a few things uh, for you. If you call Cornerstone home, uh, if you can help us out by going to our website in the top right-hand corner on the tab is a thing called Connect Form. We're trying to update all of our information. If you can go do that for us, that will help us out greatly. So uh, make sure you do that. Also, there's a kiosk, uh, floating iPad, I should say, in the um, comments that you can utilize also to do that uh, for that. Also, ladies, uh, craft and stamping scrapbook day this Wednesday on the 17th. They will be here from 9 to 4. You can come for the whole time. You can come for part of the time. They just have a lot of fun just connecting. If you're here for lunch, make sure you bring your lunch with you. And then also for all ladies, uh, high school or I should say junior high and above, um, this Thursday night is the Awaken event. Uh, Sarah Bourne Crosby is going to be here uh, with us. She's part of the Christian Missionary Alliance based out of Columbus and just going to be leading you in a time of uh, just reflection and processing. So I want to invite you into that. It's from 7 to 8 30. It's just a time to connect. So that is this Thursday night. There's some other things in there about different discipleship things going on. So I enc encourage you to check it out. Uh, the uh, last thing is we are gearing up for Beulah on the Road. We've been doing this at Cornerstone, I think, for a little bit over a decade. And what we do is a week in the summer, we'll have about 100 kids from our community, elementary 
age that will come in and fill this area. We have um, Beulah Beach, who's our uh, camp uh, up by Lake Erie, sends a group of counselors that will be here for that week. It is just a lot of fun. And we try to make it as affordable as possible. I think the cost is like 110 per kid. But we tell kids in our community anything between $20 and 110 uh, You just do what you can, and we invite them to come. So if you want to help kind of offset some of those costs and give towards that, just mark Beulah on the road uh, in the memo line for your giving, and that's what it will go towards. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you today as we come together with all the things we've encountered this week and have experienced, we recognize that you are faithful. You are present. We don't have to call you into this place or hope that you will show up, but you're here. So in that reality, we just come before you and ask your spirit to speak and challenge and correct and encourage and we desire right now to just bring honor and glory to you through our worship and leaning into your word. And we just commit this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's stand together. I know there's a lot going on in the world and in, in all of our lives, but I have to continually come back to scriptures like uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It says, rejoice always, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for, you, for us in Christ Jesus. So let's do that this morning. We're going to be on a journey of giving thanks to God because he's worthy, because he's good, because he's faithful, because he's holy, and because he is loved. So let's, would you join us? We, we don't have a, our normal drummer t today. I'm hoping that you guys can be our drummer, okay? I know, be the choir and the drummer, all right? So uh, let's put our hands together like this. Keep it going. Here we go. Let's give thanks. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, yes, He is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, yes, He is good. For He is worthy, worthy, for He is good, yes, He is good. For He is worthy. To the Lord, for He is good. Yes, He is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Yes, He is good. For He is worthy, worthy. For He is good. Yes, He is good. For He is worthy, worthy. For He is good. Bring it up now. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Yes, He is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Yes, He is good. He's worthy. He is worthy, worthy, for He is good. Yes, He is good, and He is worthy. One more time, here you go. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good, for he is worthy, worthy, for he is good. Yes, he is good, and he is worthy. Yes, he 
Some of your burdens and heaviness is even just start to fall off even now just as we sing and give thanks to the Lord. And let's sing about his faithfulness. Christ is our firm foundation.
Thousand generations. Oh, a thousand generations falling down in worship. Sing the song of ages to the Lamb. No, who gone? No, who gone before us? And all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. If you've been forgiven, and if you've been forgiven. If you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Your name, your name. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cry, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever, hear your people sing. the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Lift your hands and sing to the Lord your name. Your name. Is the highest your name, is the greatest your name, stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry. Creation cry, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing, hear 
Join with us still in heart and song, but you may be seated. We're going to sing about the deep, deep love of Jesus. So if you know this one, sing it with us.
Lord, we thank you for your love, your faithfulness, your holiness, for who you are. Lord, that you remind us of those things when we're gathered together. Lord, would you remind us more from your word as we open it up to the book of Joshua today. For those here in this room, those sitting at home, tuning in, Lord, I just pray you would speak directly to our hearts. You would transform us into your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we began uh, our series through the book of Joshua, and if you are newer to us, and just a reminder for those that have been around for a while, uh, we love the opportunity that we get to just walk through God's Word together. It uh, confronts some conversations that we would not normally have if we would just kind of pick and choose or do uh, more themes, and so I'm thankful for how God's Word has a unique way of impacting our lives and being relevant uh, to our lives right now. So uh, would you turn with me uh, in Joshua chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 9 we're going to look at, but uh, we're also going to look a few pages uh, previous to that in, in Deuteronomy 31, um, and we're going to look at that here uh, first with Deuteronomy 31. Uh, this is, we're in the midst of this transition uh, where the people of God, the Israelites, have been wandering for 40 years, and uh, at this point in time, there's a transition in leadership, and Moses is on the end and passing away, and some believe Moses to be on to his assistant Joshua, and here are some words that are being communicated. I want to look back into Deuteronomy 31, just as verses 7 and 8, that really is, is Moses speaking to Joshua in front of the people, and then we'll look at the beginning of Joshua, and there is some common themes that are being repetitive and, and uh, being reminded of. But in Deuteronomy 31, starting with verse 7, then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, in sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then we come to the beginning of Joshua in chapter 1, verse 5. Now God is speaking to Joshua and saying, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Fear. We, we, we all have fears. When a, when a baby is born into this world biologically, they tell us that they have two primary fears, uh, a fear of loud noises and a fear of falling. It's just instinct within them. I, I would say to you, not all fears are bad. In fact, when physical danger is present, a fear kicks in and we either fight or flight or flee to safety. But there are fears that each of us have that have this unique way of either paralyzing us or it motivates us 
uh, in much activity to overcome in these certain things. And I, I will tell you, in your life and in my life, fear will be a common thing that we confront and wrestle with. Now, now here's the thing that's a little bit unique about fear, or a little bit, uh, let, let me say it this way. We have this way of seeing other people's fears as ridiculous. You know what I mean by that? You, you're, you're sitting with someone and someone may be expressing fears or you see the fear and you're like, why are they afraid of that? We, we just tend to think other people's fears are like, what? what? But, but given enough time for you and I, if we sit with it long enough, we recognize that each of us has fear that we wrestle with, that we're confronted with, that, that we process through. And fear was the driving force in, this, in the midst of this transition. I understand that the people of God had come out of Egypt 400 years for this plan of this promised land. We talked a little bit last week as we introed the book that Moses sent 12 spies to go into the land, to just survey the land, to come back. They weren't coming to say whether they should go in or not. They, they were just supposed to report what they saw. And when they came back, 10 of the 12 said, there's no way. There's no way we can go in there. They were dominated by the fear that they had in them. And then for the next 40 years, this generation now that was going to enter into the promised land with Joshua's leadership, this generation had grown up underneath a group of people that had been dominated by fears of all the good reasons why they should not go into this land. Fear was the driving force. On a macro level, a big picture level, even for us as a church in this day and age, there's fears that we have going on all around us. And on a micro level, for us individually, we, we have these fears that we wrestle with, that we struggle with, and they tend to dominate oftentimes. So, so what is fear? Fear proposes itself or presents itself in, in different ways. So, some fear, it's kind of to withdraw, to flee because of feelings of inadequacy or, or without sufficient resources, or it's a distressing emotion aroused by impeding danger. Whether that threat is real or imagined, Fear is like a thermometer. It, it, it's something that measures what is happening around us and, and what's going on inside of us. And, and fear is, is this unique thing that, that isolates us. It discourages us. It paralyzes us. And I, and I will tell you this. If you, we, so oftentimes there's, there's family fears that get passed down. Fears dominate. I mean, if you listen well enough as you walk into this week, you will hear fear. Fear motivates marketing. Fear motivates our television and our social media. Fear is oftentimes revealed in the midst of conversations that we have. There's different types of fears that we have. Some, some of those deeper levels, we, we, we fear rejection. We fear being unwanted or being unworthy. We, we fear abandonment. We fear the unknown. We fear being wrong. We fear failure. We fear being incompetent or being insignificant. We, we fear, and these are real fears, that we don't want to be like someone. And maybe, maybe someone influential in your life you fear you don't want to be like, and you put the name in there. Fears dominate our thinking and our decision making. We fear commitment, security. We Fear of missing out. 
We fear being seen as weak or less than. We fear conflict. We fear loss of relationships. Fear shapes so much of our thinking and our actions. And I, I would suggest to you that each of us have some core fears. Some fears that, that feel very uh, hard and challenging. And while others may not wrestle with that, we have these core fears. So have you ever taken time to just identify what are your core fears? Are you aware of them? What, what have your fears kept you from doing or experiencing? How, how does your fear and my fear affect our daily decision-making and choices? How does your fear and my fear hold us back? And, and do you and I recognize when fear begins to emerge itself, when we're encountering things? I, I, will, I will suggest to you that in your journey in this life and my journey in this life, that pathway of discipleship, of following Jesus and, and living after him, and that fear will be consistently in front of us. And you and I will come up to one fear after another fear after another fear. And we are faced with decisions of does that fear paralyze us or withdraw or do we trust God in the midst of that? I'll tell you a little bit about my fear. I've always had this fear of the unknown. What's next? What will life be like on the other side? I, you, you've heard over time, course of my story, I grew up in Lima, Ohio, and, and, and I believed that I was going to go off to college, get my degree in education, and I was coming back to Lima, and I was going to spend the rest of my days there teaching and coaching. And in my junior year of high school, when God interrupted my well-planned and thought-out plans and called me into ministry, I was paralyzed by fear. Because I knew the place that I had been, I, I knew the people, I knew my surroundings, and this idea of going and following him and having no idea where he would lead me or where he would take me there was this fear for me, and it, it, was, it was paralyzing, and, and it was wrestling. What, what would life be like? And, and I will tell you that, that that's one of those core fears for me, and it's, it's kind of raised its ugly head at any time there is a transition or any time I'm walking into something new. Growing up in the family that I grew up in, I uh, have two brothers, I'm in the middle of the two, and then I had a younger sister that was born uh, later, about 12 years after me, and so for much of the growing up, I was that middle child, and I had this thinking in our family dynamic, my whole goal was to make people happy. And so if there was any sense of conflict that came into a setting or a situation, I, I would at all costs divert from that, uh, you know, kind of deflect anything that required a potential conflict because I feared what would be present on the other side of that conflict. What would happen within that relational dynamic? And for me, that just dominated all of my relationships, and, and if there was any ounce of conflict that would emerge, I would either try to deflect or I would withdraw. And then I got married. <laughs> and you can probably imagine how that went. Uh, in fact, uh, there were times, and uh, Heidi would tell you this, in the first few years of our marriage, that she would intentionally try to upset me. Because any kind of conflict that we had, I would just 
cover over it and just try to make it better and would never really communicate what was going on inside of me in that. And fear dominated that. And I came to understand that my fear of conflict was only creating more conflict. You, you and I have these fears. Uh, for me, too, when, I, when fear begins to emerge or begin to wrestle with it, I, I tend to be an individual who replays it over and over and over in my mind and rethinks it and rehashes it and, and has great uh, thoughts about how it should, uh, the outcome should be and all of these things, and it, it'll consume my mind. And I'll, sometimes it'll wake me up in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden I'm just thinking about this situation, and the fear just gets stronger and stronger, and, and we wrestle with these things things, you and I, it, it consumes us, it, and it consumes our decision making. How we interact, how we relate, and oftentimes our fears, when they become center stage to our thinking and our actions, it's usually when you and I begin to act as if God is not in the picture. That the outcome is dependent on me. The outcome is dependent on you and your abilities or maybe lack of abilities of withdrawal. Our fears oftentimes are irrational and debilitating and they rob us from life. And they always focus on our own abilities or the lack of our own abilities. And I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, one of the the tells of fear resting is I, I tend to question God's plan and his purpose and even his involvement in that. And here we enter into this story in this transition of leadership that happens from Moses to Joshua. And, and in there are some things that are declared both in Deuteronomy and also in Joshua that are repetitive in light of what they are about to walk into. The words from Moses, the words of the Lord are say, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. These words to Joshua uh, uh, be strong. This, this idea of being strong is being steadfast to hold your ground. Because fear, fear makes us do crazy things and makes us run and makes us flee or makes us fight. Fear has that way. But he's saying to Joshua, be steadfast, hold your ground in the, in the way we're going to walk and be courageous. Now, I, I want you to Courage is not some superhuman power that you and I somehow muster up from within ourselves. Courage is this. It's not the absence of fear, the absence of danger, but a confidence to move forward in spite of our fear and how God leads. It's that trust. For you and I to trust him in in the face of fear, will be your discipleship journey, will be my discipleship journey. As we walk, we will encounter fears, and, and in the midst of all of our fears, God calls us to trust Him. In fact, I, I'll tell you this, oftentimes in my quiet time with God, and I'm wrestling through and praying and and wrestling with my fears, there's a repetitive question that God always asks me. Peter, do you trust me? I want to know the other side. I want to know the outcome. I want to know how it goes. But God just invites us to trust him with that next step.
Where does our confidence come from? As we're walking in this world, as we're dealing with the fears around us and the fears that we wrestle with individually. Some, some amazing things are declared in these passages that we just read. One of them is God's promises. Multiple times in these short verses, through Moses and through God, just reaffirming, this is the land I'm giving you. This promise, I, I, I have found for me that oftentimes when I'm wrestling with fear, I lean back into God's word and what its promises are. There are promises that he has made, and, and even as we sang today, he, he will not fail in those. The other thing, in, in Deuteronomy 31.8, I, I think this is something that we often forget in the midst of our life and often forget in the midst of our fears. Is this reality that he will go before you? I mean, think about that. You and I know a God that is not confined by time and space like we think of time and space. That, that literally he, he declares to Joshua that I'm going before you. I'm preparing this before you. He's been to places. He's been in our future. He's in, and we have, this, we have this thing of we turn back. And in fact, in a few weeks, we will turn back and look at behind us in God's faithfulness. But I want you to know that God is faithful ahead of you. He's faithful ahead of you. And he has gone ahead of you. That, that has oftentimes been something that I've hold on. I don't know what is next, but I know you've prepared what is next. Now, I, I want to say this to you, and as we walk through this book, you will see, it, it wasn't a bed of roses, it wasn't everything went well. It wasn't like, you know, this idea that often we think in this world that our following after God means everything's going to work out and it's all going to be good and blessings and all that. I believe that God is blessing in the midst of it. But his biggest blessing for you and I, I want you to hear this, is what he declares to Joshua and he declares in the New Testament, he says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you that that let, let me say i know i know we're wired to think outcome blessings that he, he you know we get the right job or or this situation works out well or, or all of that and, and i understand we're, we're wired to think that and we often question god if things don't go that way but but i'm telling you his greatest blessing for you and i through his death and resurrection is that he says i will place my life in you see this is different we talked about in the old covenant he would travel around with them but in the new covenant through his death and his resurrection guess what he says i'm going to take up residence in you in you which means you can't outrun him which means you can't you can't flee from his presence which means you, you don't have that ability. He is present tense in you. So he will go with you. He will be faithful. And, and, and God's, and this does not always feel this way. Hear me. This does not always feel this way. But God and his grace and love for us is he will continue to present fears or your encounter walk that fear will come up and he will consistently say, do you trust me? We will walk through these months ahead and we will see battles and struggles and conflict. Remember we talked about that the picture of the promised land is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of our walk here and now. So he gives them promises he declares to them he will go before them. He declares to them he will be with them. He will not leave them or forsake them. And it also says here, one of the key things is to be in step with who God is and what he says. 
He, he literally says, meditate on his word day and night. We, we, we live in a world that is constantly selling fear. And the voices of fear are all around us. And they are strong. And here he declares to Joshua one of the realities of being strong and courageous, of walking in, is to sit in his word. His word brings life. His word confronts our fear. His word reminds us that he's present. His word reminds us of the futility of seeking after the wisdom of this world. And so we sit in it and we, we wrestle with it and we, we, we allow it to continue to shape and transform who we are. I will tell you this, I, in my own journey, and I would say as walking along, our fears are directly related to the loudest and most consistent voice in our lives. Your fears, my fears, are directly related to the loudest and more, most consistent voices in our life. And he invites Joshua and he invites you and I to sit in his word. I, I, don't, I don't know if you wrestle with that and, and fear and it's overwhelming with you. And I, I'm just, I, it's not, it's not, now, now hear my heart. It's not read one chapter to make everything feel better. It's within these words are declared life, hope, reminder. And one of the things you see all throughout the scriptures that are declared over and over is he will be present. I, I think, too, also... Um, as we lean into God's promises, the, the reality that he goes before you and the reality that he will be with you and to meditate on his word and be in step with who he is and what he says. I, I, I think some of the reality too is just being aware of our fears. I don't, I don't know if you've ever sat with that. To be aware of the fears, the core fears that you and I wrestle with and, and, and I would encourage you and this is, this is one of the things we often we often take this book and, and our North American Western mindset, we read it so, so much as an individual. Like this is all for me individually, and it is. But the context in which it is written is community. So this is what I would tell you, and this is, this is hard. Not, not where everybody knows all your fears, but, but really there must be within community. One of the powerful things is to be walking with people that know you well enough to know your fears and your struggles that you lean into and that, that are willing to walk in and at times confront, but many times just remind you that God is present, that God is faithful, that he will be with you. Because fears, fear, the enemies, I, I believe the two primary tools of the enemy are fear and shame. And fear and shame, their end result is to lead you and I to isolation. Now, I'm not talking about you just are in your home every day, all day, and never go out. I'm talking about isolation when you're in and amongst people. So walking into and exposing and presenting and people that can be with you in the midst of that is, is a gift. And I, and I will just say, if you are on the side where someone is trusting you with their struggles and their fears, that, that is that's a huge gift. And care for that well and walk alongside. As you go into life, as we walk this week, 
There's just things that are unknown to us. As we move as a church, as we go forward, there are just things that are unknown to us. We, we don't have the ability to predict one year, five year, ten years down the road, this is that. It's this daily walk. It's for you too. You, you don't know, and I, we don't know what's down there. And the obstacles and the challenges and the conflict and the setbacks and the difficulties and, and health and all relational things. We don't know, but we know that God has gone before us and God is going with us in that. that that's our confidence as we walk together. And these words that were stated over and over to Joshua are declared to Cornerstone Alliance and declared to each of us to be strong and courageous. Would you pray with me? God, as we come before you, we confess. We confess that fear has often shaped our thinking, our decision-making. It has both paralyzed us it has led us to self-sabotage in relationships. It has kept us from walking forward. It feels overwhelming. We confess that. But we confess too this reality that you are greater than our fears. You have set us free from our fears. And what you declare to Joshua and what you declare through your death and resurrection is that you will be present. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And so we, we trust you for that. I, I pray over each and every person that the things that are in front of them, maybe the fears that are shaping their thinking, I, I pray, God, that there would just be this encounter with you that you would reveal your plans and purposes and that we individually and together would have the courage to trust you in light of what appears to be overwhelming that you are faithful and you are good and that you will lead and guide us in our best days and in our hardest days. We thank you for that and commit it in your name. Amen. If you're able, let's, let's stand together. Remember, someone once said, fear, fear, or the serpent of fear often slithers in the pathway of faith. And you know, I picked this song out for us to sing, and then I, as I'm reflecting and hearing Peter's reminders from the Word, I'm like, you know, there's some fears that God has, has delivered me from, some that he hasn't yet. <laughs> and I, you may feel the same way. Uh, so to sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear, may, may be looking to where his perfect love is complete and driving out every fear in our lives. But nonetheless, let's sing this together and, and just um, remind ourselves we don't have to be a slave to fear because of what he's done. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song
From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood runs through my veins. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am child of God, and I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God, and I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child God, do you declare in your word that perfect love casts out fear? And so I pray in each of our journeys and the things that are ahead of us, I pray and thank you that your spirit will continue to confront those fears that we wrestle with in your grace, your love for us, to declare that you are big enough You are enough as we walk in this world. And so I pray beyond just words, I pray that reality as we walk as your sons and daughters into this week of the things that we know are ahead, but so many things that are unknown. 
I pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us to be strong and courageous and trusting you with the next step that you have for us. And so we commit that I pray your blessing upon each and every person as they walk into this week, as we walk together. And we give you thanks for your faithfulness and your goodness. And we commit it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you would, in about five, ten minutes, help us tear down uh, for youth group tonight, we would appreciate that.